I'm going to talk um, this morning a, a little bit about lung function testing, um, how we monitor LAM as time goes by, and um, how we treat airway symptoms, which is really, really talking about use of inhalers for LAM. So um, it's a bit of a dry topic, lung function tests, actually. Um, but actually, they're, they're quite important in, in, in the management of LAM, and I think it's probably sensible to talk about them because actually everybody has to have them quite done often. Um, they're horrible to do, aren't they? No one really likes having them done. When you're sort of in the week where you're about to have them done, you start to get worried about whether the, the numbers will have changed, and it sort of reminds you that you have LAM when you've sort of spent the previous three or six months not thinking about it, hopefully, too much. Um, and so I thought it was good to talk about the importance of it. The other thing about lung function tests is you have to interpret them in the context of the whole person, not just exactly, you know, if your FEV1 has gone down by 8%, is that 8% is that more bad? Uh, that, that's not necessarily true. So I'm just going to talk around some of those issues and a little bit about the evidence for that. And uh, lung function, one of the things that they measure is airway function. I'm just going to talk a little bit about treating airway function with, with inhalers because that's a bit of a sort of... Um, it's a bit of a dark art for people with LAM. There's no guidelines or anything. <coughs> so, um, so the talk really is about lung function tests. What do the individual tests mean? How do we relate that to how your LAM is? And how do we track whether your LAM's stable or whether it's progressing? <coughs> And I'm also going to talk a little bit about inhalers and LAM. So when we make an assessment, um, when we say when we see someone with LAM for the first time uh, about how bad their disease is, um, we use different measurements really. I'm just going to talk a little bit about each one. We, we, first thing that, that, that we look at usually is a person's lung scan and that's often how the diagnosis of LAM gets to be made because you see the characteristic appearance on a scan when someone comes to see you with respiratory symptoms. Then we assess severity a bit by doing a, a different lung function tests. And we heard a little bit about those in the rehab session this morning. And of course, there are also the symptoms and how people feel themselves, which is perhaps the, the most important um, thing that impacts on quality of life and function. So, so we do see T scans a lot. Um, and they're more complex and they're more costly and there's more radiation than an x-ray. But we have to really do those because very often the x-ray in somebody with mild lamb like this one here is completely normal. You can't see mild lamb on an x-ray. You can see more advanced disease sometimes. X-ray is a useful screening test but actually um, you miss a lot of the lungs, the area behind the heart's invisible, the area under the diaphragm just behind the diaphragm domes is, is invisible. And you, you just get one picture from front to back. And if you do a CT scan, you get maybe 100 slices through the lungs in much more detail. So just to orient you with a CT scan, so when you have a CT scan, um, like a little cartoon person there, you're lying on a table, and the scan, <laughs> they slide you into the scanner, so it's like being sort of um, in the middle of a giant donut. Um, which is maybe a fantasy for some people, I don't, I don't know. Um, and what we see is a cross-sectional picture through the person. And so if you imagine that you're looking at a cross-section from the direction of feet, the scans begin to make sense. So this is a normal CT scan. So the, 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 the scanner table are those lines at the bottom of the picture. And so the patient's back is lying on the table, so that's the spine. And then the top of the picture is the front of the person, and that's the, that's the breastbone, the sternum there. That's the heart in the middle. And then you can see the two, the right and the left lung, sort of on the wrong way around. But as I say, if you imagine you're looking from the feet, it starts to make sense. And this is a normal background, grey colour. I'm not sure how well it's going to show up at the back, actually. But the lungs look this uh, sort of background, neutral grey colour. The white things are, are blood vessels, mostly. And so this is a normal scan. And this is a scan of somebody with LAM. So, so these cysts are the hallmark of having LAM. So actually, what you see here, most of the lungs, the normal grey colour, this is somebody with fairly mild disease. And then they have these cysts from in place to place to have little walls around them. And this is, this is what LAM looks like normally. Um, 
as the disease progresses, the cysts sort of become more numerous. As I say, this is somebody with mild disease, they've got a fairly normal lung function. This person has, has really quite severe LAM, um, and you can see that there's lots of cysts and not much lung tissue. Now, it's quite easy to tell the difference between the first one, the, the mild case, and this more advanced case, but actually for monitoring the dis disease as time goes by, Doing CT scans regularly don't tell you that much. So if you did one every year, it would be very hard to see if there were more cysts or the cysts were a little larger um, year on year. And it's hard to measure these precisely by eye. There are programs that you can use, but they, they're not really in routine practice. Having a CT scan is maybe the equivalent um, X-ray dose of 100 chest X-rays. And so although it's OK to have two or three CT scans over a long period, if you did them every year, um, you know, starting in your 30s, um, then the radiation dose would sort of would mount up, and that, that's, that's not a helpful thing. Um, although there are various groups, including the, the um, LAM group at the NIH, working on low-dose CT scans, so uh, perhaps we'll be able to use CT a bit more for monitoring people in the future. So the way we monitor people is not to do the scan every so often. It's always nice to have a picture to look at rather than a whole list of numbers, but actually the lung function tests are more accurate and more clinically useful, and we understand the trajectory of them a bit better. So I'm going to talk a bit about lung function tests now. So um, in sort of pretty um, basic terms, the, the main compartments of the lung are uh, the uh, airways, um, so the, uh, the trachea and the bronchi that branch out about and split about 24 times uh, to make the airways, and these move the air from the, uh, from the um, mouth uh, down to these little sacs at the end, which are the alveoli. The alveoli's job is to take oxygen from the air, get it into your bloodstream so it can make energy to power your muscles and uh, do all of those other things and uh, get rid of waste products. The other, the other key bit of the lungs is the, is the blood vessels that run through them where that, um, that, that get the oxygen and, and, and take it around the body. So um, <coughs> LAM affects the airways and the alveoli um, differently. And to get a full assessment of LAM, we actually need different tests. So we need tests of your airway function and we need tests of your alveolar function. And so most of you, when you come for your LAM reviews in most places, will have more than one type of lung function test. You usually have the group of tests called spirometry, and you'll usually have an estimation of your gas transfer. There's other things that you can do, but those are the sort of two things I'm going to sort of focus on, really. So, so this, is the, this is the main test of airway function. This is spirometry. So this is the one, take a big breath in from the room, blow as hard as you can till you're empty, then breathe in till you're full again. Uh, usually, you see, here's somebody uh, blowing away. Uh, this measures the maximum breath you can take. So, or FVC, this sta that which stands for forced vital capacity. So that's a maximum volume of your breath. For most women with LAM, that stays fairly normal, actually. Um, the other thing it measures is how quickly the air flows through your airways. And the test that we use to, to record that, uh, for the most part, is this thing called FEV1. Uh, so um, when you do the spirometry test, uh, you get a, uh, one of the ways you can represent it is in this type of trace. So this is the amount you blow out on the vertical axis, and this is how long it takes to empty your lungs um, on the horizontal axis. So if you look at the blue line, a, a normal, um, somebody with normal lung function, you can see that actually most of the air comes out of the lungs, actually there's no uh, time scale on there, but within about two to three seconds on the whole. And this measurement here where the line is, this, um, this FEV1 measurement here, um, that is the volume that you blow out in the first second, and that's usually about 70 to 80 percent of your total volume. The person um, with uh, that's labelled obstructive here with this red line, I think it is, um, 
has narrowed airways. So what you can see is they can empty their lungs pretty much to the same extent as the person with normal lung function, but it happens over a longer time period. Their airways are narrow and the flow is, is slower through those, through those airways. And so after a second of blowing, they've probably only emptied about a third of their, their lungs, maybe a, maybe a little bit less. And actually, as LAM progresses, this FEV1 value tends to fall, and it's one of the best understood markers of, of disease progression. The other thing that spirometry tests tell you is if you can change <coughs> airflow by relaxing the muscles around the, around the air passages. So if you give somebody a, a, a drug, a bronchodilator, that relaxes the muscle around the airways, you can see that uh, in this, this is the same person before they've taken the inhaler and afterwards, and you can see that they've been able to blow out more air, and it's come out more quickly. Um, I put the animation on? Oh, no, I haven't. But, um, and you can see that there's a sort of an increase here in the amount of air that they move out. And that, if you have airway narrowing, that's often a useful uh, benefit in terms of improving symptoms. So. The other group of tests that we, uh, uh, that we follow um, is a measure of gas transfer. So to try and get a handle on how efficiently the oxygen in your air spaces, your alveoli, gets into your bloodstream, which is the, the main job of the lungs, really. And that's, used, that's called DLCO or sometimes TLCO. So that's diffusion in the lung of carbon monoxide. And we use carbon monoxide as a tracer gas. Now, everybody knows that's poisonous, but it's a tiny amount. Um, so what happens when you do the test? So this is the one where you blow out till you're empty, breathe in till you're full, hold for 10 seconds. That's always a good bit, isn't it? And then breathe out into the machine at the end. And what you breathe in um, is the, a tiny amount of the tracer gas, uh, some helium and mostly, <laughs> mostly air otherwise. And that, the more of the tracer gas that gets into your bloodstream, uh, when you blow out at the end, there's, there's less of the tracer left because it's gone into the bloodstream. Um, so we can quantitate how efficiently you get gases into, into your bloodstream. So it sort of measures oxygen uptake, but that's really how well matched the blood vessels and the alveoli are in the lungs. Um, normally, the alveoli, are, the blood vessels are right round the um, outside of the alveolar sac, and so it's a, there's a very short distance that the oxygen diffuses into the bloodstream and the, and the carbon dioxide diffuses out. Um, Measuring the gas transfer for people with LAM particularly is more sensitive to changes in the lung structure than measuring things like the FEV1. And there, what you see in people with LAM is sometimes different patterns of, of change. Some people have low DLCO and fairly normal spirometry, and sometimes less commonly the other way around. But most people lose FEV1 and DLCO somewhat in parallel, and we'll talk about that a bit later. Much less is known, actually, about what happens to this measurement over the course of LAM than, than, than FEV1, which is surprising considering it's usually the first thing that changes. So when you, come, when you have your lung function tests, um, you usually end up with a whole pile of numbers like this, which is much less interesting, <laughs> really, than the CT scan. What we do... Um, is that we, uh, we look at your values and then we compare them with what they should be. And to do that, we, uh, somebody has recorded the lung function of lots and lots of pe healthy people uh, and looked at how that changes with age, how that changes with height, and how that changes with ethnic origin. All these three factors affect what your lung function should be. So if you look at these lung function tests here, and you get all these different columns. The first column here is the predicted value. So this says for somebody of your age, of your height, of your sex, um, and of your ethnic origin, what should your lung function be if it was completely normal? The next column is the lung function that we've just measured from you. Uh, and then the column at the end um, is the percent predicted. So that's the easiest thing to interpret. So that's your values compared with other women of your age and height as a percentage. Now, the normal ranges are quite wide. So like in the same way that people's feet and noses are sort of different sizes, for, uh, the people's lungs tend to be different sizes, even for people of the same height. So the ranges are quite wide. So, uh, 
So if we look at, if we look at this person here, um, this, is, uh, this is the value for FEV1. Well, let's try and do the magnify thing. Um, and so if you look at their FEV1 here, predicted 2.6, theirs is 2.7. Um, and so that's 104% are predicted. So that's, that, that's spot on normal, really. Um, this is a person with LAM. Like many people with LAM, the, uh, the spirometry may be almost normal. Um, this person's gas transfer, their, uh, this di the diffusion measurement I've just spoken about, there should be eight. Theirs is, um, theirs is four and a half. And so that is just over half of the predicted value, and we often see this. And one of the tricky things about this, of course, is if you go to your GP and have a lung function test with, with the practice nurse, for example, which is commonly done, they only do the spirometry. So they'll say, oh, look, your lung function's completely fine. Don't know why you're breathless. Just get a bit fitter or, or something like that. that. That can easily happen and no doubt has to some of you. Um, so you need to do the different lung function tests to get the proper picture, really. But um, as I say, the range is quite wide. So for the percent predicted, actually everything over about 80 is in the normal range. And so some people might start off with lung function of 120. Obviously, if you start off with high lung function, if you're going to get a lung disease, you've got a bit more in reserve. That's a generally good thing. But the ranges are fairly wide. So if, you're, if your DLCO is 80, it might be normal. It might not necessarily be, be low. And other things can affect lung function without really affecting the lungs. If you have a pneumothorax and then need a pleurectomy, an operation to fix um, the pneumothorax, your chest wall won't move so much after that. And particularly in the couple of months after the operation, your lung function might be a bit lower. It doesn't mean your lungs are worse. It just means your chest doesn't move so much and your lungs are constricted by that. So you have to look at them in the context of everything else. So um, the other type of uh, uh, tests that we do are walking tests. And we heard a bit from Maria this morning about these types of tests um, and how they're used to assess pulmonary rehabilitation. And they're important because they're functional sort of tests. Um, and they sort of tell us a bit more about real world performance. And although somebody with low lung function would be more likely to have worse results on a walking test, there's not a direct relationship. Um, so there's a couple of things we do. There's a six-minute walk test. It takes an hour. Um, and that's, that's because you have to have two goes. as a little practice go, and then you have to recover and do it again. So crudely, it measures how far you can walk. Um, and that depends on how good your lung function is. But also, as we've heard really nicely demonstrated, how good your leg muscles are, um, how fit you are otherwise, how determined you are, um, how much you want to beat the record of last time and there are people that come with their training shoes and ask what the maximum distance is not saying who those people are but um, <laughs> so um, anyway um, and um, and the other thing it measures is what your oxygen level is when you're exerting yourself you should really be able to keep your oxygen level steady as you as you work as you're you know as you're walking your muscles use more oxygen your lungs have to keep up with the extra demand they should be able to um, if your if your lungs aren't working to their uh, uh, properly then your oxygen level might fall and uh, and so this gives us information on this and it's sort of not completely related to lung function the, the cheap and cheerful version of this is a corridor walk test where you just get the person to walk up and down until they're a bit breathless, measure their oxygen saturation with a little finger probe. That just takes a few minutes. Um, it, doesn't, it, measures, it, it measures whether people's oxygen falls with exertion, which is helpful. So if you walk somebody up and down the corridor or up and down the stairs and they get out of breath, um, if their oxygen's fall and that's their main component of breathlessness might be that, that might be their lung condition. If their oxygen's pretty okay, it hasn't really changed, but they're quite out of puff, then they, it, there's an element of deconditioning, of fitness there, and that's often reassuring for people. And we can sort of tackle that with things like the rehabilitation that we heard about earlier. So, so we measure those things. So these are corridor. These are just a few. Um, 
uh, people who've done corridor walk tests. So this little dot is the starting oxygen saturation. The green zone's completely normal, the white zone's sort of okay. And then these are lower values down here. And so before the walk, you can see that everybody's saturation's sort of okay. Um, after they've walked up and down and got breathless for a few minutes, you can see that although some of the people who start off lower have, have big falls, that's not always the case. And there are, there are people uh, whose oxygen doesn't change a great deal when they walk. And it's not completely related to their lung function. So this tells us something extra. So all of these different tests um, help us to manage people. So when we're, working, when we're trying to say, how bad's my lamb, um, we look at what your lung function is like, um, in terms of your airways, your gas transfer. We look at your scan, how many cysts have you got? Um, and we also look and see what your exercise performance is and, and, and what happens with your oxygen level. But of course, that's not the whole thing. You're not just a load of numbers. Um, it, it varies. Um, other factors are important in terms of you know, your exercise performance might be a bit lower if you're older. Um, if you've had lamb for a very long time and your lung function is a little bit impaired, that probably means you've got fairly mild disease because you've had it for a long time, it hasn't got too bad. If you're younger with impaired lung function, that's perhaps more important. What's happened to you before is important. What other lamb symptoms have you got? Do you have chylus problems? Have you, had, uh, have you needed surgery for things? And of course, what your symptoms are. Some people have quite bad symptoms in the presence of fairly normal lung function. Uh, and some people have impaired lung function and actually aren't too bothered by things. And so all of these factors sort of go in to work out your lamb. So what I'm sort of saying in a very long-winded way is when you look at your FEV1 and say, oh, mine's 70%, that's not so good. Um, if, you, if it's been like that for a long time and you basically don't have very many symptoms or, or other problems, uh, that actually might be, that might be quite good and quite reassuring for the future. It's, it's not just about lung function, it's about everything. Um, so... That's a sort of baseline assessment. When people come up for their, for their assessment, I mean, the, the people we see, um, if you see somebody once or twice a year, actually, I hadn't realized this at first, but people get quite stressed by just the fact that their appointment's looming and what's happening with their lung function. Does it mean that I'm progressing or are things stable? We spend a lot of time trying to work out whether disease is progressing or not. So what you have to bear in mind, of course, is that everyone, um, their lung function, along with a lot of other things, get lower with age. <laughs> so for a normal person, um, your FEV1 value will, um, uh, will fall by about 20 millilitres a year. If you have lamb and you're not on any treatment, and these are from historical data because we try and treat people before this happens nowadays, um, you probably lose FEV1 at about 100 millilitres a year on average, although the range is from normal to much faster than that. And, and th these lines are, are people's FEV1 over, actually, the, this is 280 months up to here, so a, long, a, a lot of years. Each line's a person's FEV1. And so you can see there's a huge range here. So there are people up here with, this is 80%, so this would be normal. All these people have fairly normal lung function. This person I've highlighted in green there goes up and down, but actually it never dips into the, uh, into the abnormal range. Then you've got somebody with more uh, sort of progressive disease here and somebody with really quite advanced disease here and everybody in between. And so what we really want to do is see as quickly as we can as to which trajectory we're on. And the importance of this, of course, is this person needs some treatment, this person needs some treatment, this person may never need any treatment. So we don't want to give them a drug that they have to take for life, that has side effects, that needs monitoring, um, that they might not need. And the, our challenge often is to work out which trajectory they're on. And that's where things get tricky. Of course, just to remind you all, um, these are people who never had any treatment because there wasn't any available. Now we have rapamycin. We can level this out really quite nicely, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. So the big question is my disease progressing, which is in everybody's minds, really, is often tricky to answer, and this is why, really. 
Um, if you do your FEV1 every day, um, it can go up and down by about 5% if, if, if you have normal lung function. If you have airway narrowing, it varies quite a lot more. And in this very old paper where people used to look at lung function a lot uh, in the olden days, because that's all we had, um, they saw that the change really had to be about 17% uh, to be significant. So a 17% change, if your FEV1 is 2, um, I should have worked this out beforehand, shouldn't I? Um, go, it might, it might go up to sort of 2.3, 2.4, or down to 1.6-ish, and they might all be the same. They might just be natural variation. But if you, if you looked at your lung function and you went, oh, look, it's, it's, quite, you know, it's 200 millilitres lower, you'd be worried. But you, know, you don't necessarily have to be, and I spend a lot of time saying this to people. Um, so your tests might vary, but your lung function might not be that different, really. Um, and this is what sort of happens. So this is, this is some of these lung function over a few years that I look after. Um, so say we're seeing her on, on this day here. Um, these are the FEV1 values, and these are the, these are the gas transfer values. And the FEV1 is about the same as the last visit. The gas transfer has gone from 5.7 to 5. Okay. So is that bad? Um, is that worse? I mean, obviously, it, it's always disappointing when lung function falls. Should this person be worried that their disease is progressing? Well, if you just wait and do it again, the next time, a few months later, it's actually gone back up to pretty much the same level as there. And then a few months, a year later after this one, it's still the same. And so this is just natural variation. If every time you come, it's a, it's a little lower than the last, that's a different thing. But these are quite variable. So when, I, when you have your lung function and you know, somebody says to you, you look at the numbers, they might be a little bit lower and everybody goes, oh, that's about the same. Um, you sort of go, but isn't that a bit lower? And then you, you sort of, people don't really believe you about this. And, and the other side of the coin is if they're a little bit higher, goes, oh, yes, it's great. That's really good. It's a bit better, isn't it? It's about the same. And then people seem quite sort of disappointed by that. <laughs> but it's, it's natural variability. And the main thing to do is to not panic with these small changes. Uh, this, is, this, is a, this is a person with LAM. Um, so there's 12 years of FEV1 tests here. And you can see that um, this is a person before they, uh, we had rapamycin and the lung function fell gradually. And it's sort, of, you know, it's sort of going down fairly steadily. But just imagine if you were seeing them just at the beginning of this trajectory. Um, actually, the slope of change is actually sort of probably getting a little bit higher overall. Then the next bit, it goes down. Then it sort of levels out. Um, and then it levels out a bit more. Um, so if you, if you look over a short period of time, you get quite confusing answers as to what the overall trajectory is. Because if you remember, actually, probably just a fairly smooth line for a long period. So one of the things that we've been trying to do um, is to try and work out how reliable lung function tests are. So. Um, Poor old Jan. So she ran lung uh, action for 20 years, and then she sort of retired and thought she was, she thought, oh, I'm done with LAM now. Um, uh, but what, she, what happens now um, is that every, one day a week she comes in and mines lung function data doing research I, 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 into LAM, and these are, these are some of the things she's done. And we, what we've been trying to do, the two of us, is answer these questions about how variable lung function is. So uh, Jan used to be a lung function technician in her previous life, um, uh, and uh, now sees more lung function tests than uh, she perhaps wants. But what she's done here is those long slopes with lots of points in, we've, what we've tried to do is we've said, what's the real slope using all the points? And we've said, OK, so maybe the change is 100 millilitres a year. So if we saw the first two measurements of that, what would the slope look like then? And then if it was three, and if it was four, and if it was five. And what we see, this is a, these are graphs of variation around the real value. And so if we measure anything less than about six, seven, maybe eight sets of lung function, the variation's so wide, it's just very confusing. And if we look for 
uh, shorter than a one-year period, which is about down here, uh, the values are quite confusing. So we really need about s at least six measurements and maybe a year of looking to see whether your lung function is stable or changing. So uh, d just having one test um, isn't super helpful. Now this is, a, this is a problem for looking after people with LAM because we want to actually get people on treatment as soon as they need it but not treat people who don't need it. And we don't really want to wait for a year or two years till we're, we're sure what's going on. So how do we decide whether somebody's lamb's getting worse? Well, we look at the lung function, obviously, but we also talk to people. Are they getting progressively more breathless? Is, there, is their exercise performance dropping off? Um, if somebody's lung function looks like it's falling a little bit, but their symptoms are completely unchanged, then it's probably not actually if they're getting more breathless and the lung function's dropping, then we take that more seriously. And we follow the trend of, in lung function. The more time and the more points, the more reliable it gets. Of course, you have to take this in context. If your lung, initial lung function is really quite high, the variation doesn't have much of an impact. You might still need, you, we might still want to prevent any, any loss of lung function. We also have to make sure that it's not something else that's affecting the lung function test, like have you had lots of infections and is it a bit low because of that? Have you had a pneumothorax or an operation or is there some other problem that's making your lung function worse? So one of the things to try and work out whether we can predict more quickly um, whether your lung function is changing, is to also use the LCO. Most people look at FEV1. We looked at all of the patients um, uh, with the LCO. Again, this is something Jan's done. So if you look um, for all our patients who are not on treatment with rapamycin, FEV1 average falls 82 milliliters a year. The DLCO falls by 0.17 little bit faster before the menopause, a little bit slower afterwards. And if you sort of plot these out, um, if you compare how FEV1 changes with DLCO, each one of these lines is the, how the, the, these two lung function measures change together in the same person. So if they were changing at the same rate, then all the arrows would run down here. What you see is most of the arrows do run down here, but there's nobody, well, very few people in this box. When we see people, their DLCO has already fallen out of this normal box into these slightly abnormal areas here, mm -hmm. but their FEV1 um, is, is still roughly normal. So what, what I think these data mean is that your DLCO is probably the first thing to go down, and before you're diagnosed, it's sort of creeping down a little bit, whereas your FEV1 is relatively well preserved. As, as, as LAM gets more advanced, actually they seem to fall together as far as, I, as far as these data suggest. It also tells us a, an interesting thing about rapamycin. So this is the same sort of thing. These arrows are summaries of all the arrows, so it makes it a little easier to look at. So the good news is, so these are our patients, remember, no treatment for FEV1 changing by 82 milliliters a year. If we give people rapamycin, FEV1 is completely steady, or actually plus eight. It's getting a little bit better. That's, that's, that's even stopping the aging change. Um, so rapamycin is very effective at stabilizing FEV1. What we see is that actually the DLCO is still going down a, a, a bit. Um, perhaps half as quickly as it did before, whereas the FV1 pretty much stabilizes. And these little arrows here, these are the people on no treatment, the blue ones. The red arrows, they change direction. So the FV1 stays where it is. The gas transfer drops a little bit. And that's what we, that's what we tend to see. So I think doing these DLCO measurements tells us a little bit about, uh, about what's happening with rapamycin, and it tells us about early disease. So uh, we will, we're, one of the things that we're doing at the LAM Center now is taking a bit more notice and recording the DLCO values in a bit more detail to, to plot patient trajectories. So to summarize all of that, which was for the train spotters really, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> spirometry and DLCO tell us uh, about the degree of lung damage. Walking tests add information about function. 
and the severity of the disease, you have to synthesize all these bits of information and put it together and look at the whole person in front of you. And so it's not wise to get too hung up about small changes in your lung function. Over the short term, it's quite difficult to monitor whether what your lung function is doing. And DLCO is handy in certain situations. For people with very early disease and for people with rapamycin, it looks like from the work that Jan's been doing recently. And really, there's no substitute for talking about uh, where you think your disease is with, with your doctor rather than just looking at your lung function tests. And the other thing that we need to do, and one of the things that when people come to the LAM Centre, <laughs> Nobody has not signed up for this research project. It's an amazing response. Um, we're looking at um, blood tests and other markers that, 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 that will predict change earlier or even predict prognosis um, bef before it happens. And that's one of our ongoing plans because that's one of the things that's an important need for, for looking after people with LAM. So I'm um, just going to do 10 minutes on inhalers for LAM uh, now. <coughs> So actually, inhalers modify airway function, and they're probably the most um, commonly used drug for that. Much, much, many more people take inhalers than, than use rapamycin or use oxygen or, or, or any of the things. There's absolutely no evidence whatsoever about who should use inhalers, about which inhaler they should use, when they should use them, and what to do. So we've, we've been trying to sort of gather a bit of evidence around those questions. And we certainly see a lot of this sort of thing. Um, so people go to their doctor because they're breathless and they're wheezy, they're a young person, um, and so a diagnosis of asthma often gets made. Um, and then someone, says, someone finds out they have lamb in uh, eventually. We, I've seen this quite a few times, people saying, well, my, I, I'm not on any treatment now. My doctor stopped all my inhalers when, uh, when I didn't have asthma. And of course, these inhalers were for a treatment of asthma. And yes, the person probably doesn't have asthma, but they probably still benefit from them in certain situations. So the main type of inhaler we use in LAM are, are ones called bronchodilators. So the bronchi are the little tubes, the airways that take the uh, air from the mouth to the alveoli. Um, they're tubes. They have them. Um, they have this layer of smooth muscle inside them. No one knows what smooth muscle round airways is for. It seems to cause asthma and cause trouble in lamb. It, they call it the appendix of the lungs. It's just, it, no one knows what it does. If you take it away you, by bronchial thermoplasty, nothing bad happens. It's, um, it's a, an annoying and pointless structure, but uh, I've done a, spent a lot of my life investigating it, so it's a living, you know. Sort of. um, <laughs> the, um, if your muscle gets bigger or contracts more, um, then that will narrow the, uh, narrow the airway. And the physics of a tube means that you only need to narrow the, the tube by a small amount to really increase the resistance and reduce the flow of air through that tube. So, Targeting this over-contracted muscle is, is, is often effective. And I've shown you this thing before. This is, um, this is a spirometry test before an inhaler and afterwards. And you see, so this is the FEV1. So this is the amount that's come out in one second, and it's 2.6 or something. And then you take the inhaler, and it goes up to coming up for three. So, and that, that increase in airflow is a useful thing. So there's different types of bronchodilators. And there's ones that work in the short term. You uh, you take them, they, the onset of action is two to five minutes, and they probably last about four hours. And a common one is Ventolin or Salbutamol. Uh, lots of people are on that. It's a very commonly used drug for asthma. There are now, um, have been for a couple of decades actually, um, long-acting uh, beta agonists. So beta agonists are drug that relax smooth muscle by activating beta receptors, which are signaling um, receptors on, on muscle cells, and they cause a muscle to stop contracting. And there's a, there's a number of these long-acting beta agonists around now. There's an interesting paper from the American group um, last year, I think, which, um, uh, which even suggested that using some of these long-acting beta agonists regularly uh, affected the signaling within lamb cells to, to, to slow their growth. 
And so the American group is suggesting that these things might not just relax your airways, but actually might help your lamb at, uh, at some level in, in the longer term. There's another group of drugs that relax your airways through a different set of receptors, uh, called acetylcholine receptors. And so drugs like Spireva um, uh, work, work in that way. And you can now get combined inhalers that have a beta agonist and a, an anti-muscarinic drug in them together. You take them once a day. They last for about 18 hours. And actually, they're very convenient to use. You don't have to carry them around. And you, there seems to be a useful combined benefit. The other big group of inhalers are inhaled steroids. Asthma is an inflammatory disease. And inhaled steroids reduce inflammation. And they improve asthma. And they're a very good treatment for that. LAM is not the same type of inflammatory condition as asthma. And inhaled steroids have never been looked at in, a, in, um, in LAM at all. And actually, they have more side effects than these other drugs. There's an increased risk of pneumonia. And so we're questioning whether everybody with LAM really should be on an inhaled steroid. And I, I think probably the answer to that's no. Um, this is a pie chart showing um, all the different combinations of long-acting beta agonists, short-acting beta agonists, anti-muscarinic steroids that people use. And actually, it's every one you can imagine. Um, and you can see, so these people aren't on inhalers. All of these people are. The ones are the white boxes. And, and nearly a quarter of people are on an inhaled steroid, despite the fact that it might not be doing very much. Um, so there's, what this says is there's no consensus about what to do. And so we really do need a better consensus about what, which inhalers to use for LAM. Um, so when we looked at, our, um, uh, at the people we see in Nottingham, um, we test everybody when they come for their first visit as to whether they respond to bronchodilators. And what these graphs are, are this, these, these show um, people with, uh, it's a bit fuzzy, isn't it? Um, this bar here is people with it, whose FEV1 is in the normal range and then um, the mild, moderate, and more severe reduction. And the, uh, the higher the bar, the uh, the more people in that group of people that will respond by standard criteria to a bronchodilator. And actually about a quarter of women with LAM um, have a measurable response, the same as someone with asthma, to, to one of these inhalers. And we see that's more likely if your FEV1 is low and actually if your DLCO is low as well. Um, some people in Brazil did a, did a study using short-acting beta agonists and see if that helped exercise uh, symptoms in LAM. It didn't, actually. But they haven't, we haven't yet looked at the long-acting ones. We haven't looked at the anti-muscarinic sort of combinations, and that needs to be done, really. So who might benefit from, from these inhalers? When we looked at the people who had the standard improvement um, in airflow when they took a bronchodilator compared with those who didn't who had LAM, we saw that the people who had the biggest response tended to be a bit younger, they had lower lung function, and these are the people that obviously got prescribed inhalers or, and continued to take the inhalers, and they're also more likely to be on rapamycin for LAM. So it's probably a, people, a group of people with, with slightly younger, more active disease, one, one, would, one would suggest. Actually, lots of these people got put on the inhaler in the first place because their GP or somebody else thought they had asthma um, rather than making a firm diagnosis of LAM. But in a way, for most of those things, that's, that's perhaps not too important. So these are, on the whole, safe drugs, uh, bronchodilators. The beta agonist type drugs sometimes cause a little bit of a tremor. The anti-muscarinic drugs can cause dry mouth and sometimes sinus pain. Some people are sensitive to that, but on the whole, most people tolerate them really well. If you have lots of beta agonists through a nebulizer, with a, which is a high a system that gives you a high dose, then, then you can have other complications. But we don't usually do that for people with LAM. In practice, they're very safe drugs. Inhaled steroids are not the same. and. Um, and there's an increased risk of pneumonia in, in people who use inhaled corticosteroids through it, um, for COPD and other lung conditions. And so um, I tend not to use inhaled corticosteroids apart from particular situations. 
And so this is really my sort of personal view of what we do. There's no, there's, there's no evidence for, for this, but, you know, you can go, there's no evidence, so I'm not going to do anything. Or you can sort of, you know, you can do what seems practically appropriate. Um, so if somebody has no problem with their lung function and they, uh, you know, they don't get particularly breathless or wheezy when they exert themselves, lung function is normal, you know, they don't really need to take anything. If you get a few symptoms or you've got very minor airway narrowing um, and you find yourself getting a bit wheezy or a bit more breathless you expect when you say, you know, do aerobics or whatever it is, um, or go white water rafting, um, <laughs> then, um, then you might want to use a short-acting beta agonist just to get the maximum airflow in that situation. So something like salbutamol, mm -hmm. perhaps just on an as-required basis, maybe, you know, once or twice a week, maybe. If you've, got, uh, if you've got airway narrowing, particularly if you respond to bronchodilators when, when we test them, uh, and that's limiting your exercise capacity, I usually use one of these uh, long-acting anti-muscarinic anti beta agonist combinations. You take them once a day, you can forget about them after that. They give you a background level of, uh, uh, of bronchodilation. Inhaled steroids I reserve for people who have lamb and asthma, and there's a few of those around. Asthma's a common problem. Um, or if they've got very asthma-like sort of aspect to their, um, to their lamb. If they have a very big reversibility and get wheezy often. If they have other signs of atopy, so tests that go along with an asthma-like phenotype, like a high IgE or nitric oxide level. Um, or if they've had childhood asthma, then I'll, I'll use inhaled corticosteroids. They're, on the whole, they're pretty safe, but I don't think they should be used randomly. Um, we've got Maria Kokosi from the Brompton here. Uh, Maria, what, what, do, you, do you guys do the same thing at the Brompton? Uh, I mostly use uh, LABA, the long-acting beta agonist. Uh, I will add a steroid inhaler if there is convincing history of asthma. So okay. I don't. I haven't used llama very much. Okay. So I mean that's pretty similar to us. Yeah. I mean, the the reversibility testing. If someone if someone's quite reversible, then clearly they're going to get a benefit. But if they have airway narrowing and you can't measure a significant change, that even happens in asthma as well. And so. Usually, yes, you can give people a trial of an inhaler, can't you? And actually, as you all know, if you've got an inhaler and it does nothing at all, sort of eventually it just gets left in the drawer, doesn't it? And you don't pick up your next prescription. So if mo most people can make a sensible decision about whether to continue with a treatment based on their response. So um, that's it, really. That's all I really had to say. I just wanted to say thank you for, to everybody who volunteers for research at the, at the LAM Center. As I said, nobody's ever said no. And it, it really helps that all of these data about lung function all come from that program. And I'm grateful to people at the LAM Center who sit, see everybody and, and, and help us collect the data. Um, the person who's done most for this talk really is Jan. So since she retired from lung, LAM Action and has been doing research for us, um, She's uh, contributed to, I think, well, about her third paper now. This is a little picture of her presenting the work at Lamposium uh, last year uh, in the States. So thanks to Jan, and uh, thanks for your attention. I think we're too close, aren't we? <laughs> um, we w we've got probably five minutes or so just to take a few questions. If anyone has any questions for Simon, um, I do have a couple from the Facebook feed as well for you, but if there's anyone in the room that has a question, just pop your hand up and uh, we'll get a microphone to you. There are a couple of questions on landline, one of which I think you've already answered, which is whether TLCO and DLCO are the same thing? Yeah, they are. Um, yeah, sorry, we're, uh, yes, they, they are exactly the same test. And then the other question was what KCO? Okay, so the KCO is... Um, your DLCO corrected for the accessible volume of the lung when you tested it. So if you measure, if you, if you have big lungs, then your, your DLCO will be bigger than if you have small lungs. If you correct it for how big your lungs are, then, then there's a measurement uh, which, which, which factors out the size of the lungs, and that's what the KCO is. It's a, I don't use it quite so much. It's quite a complicated, the way you calculate it and measure it's fairly complicated, um, but it, it's another index of, of gas transfer. Uh. 
What's irreversibility? Irreversibility. Okay, so uh, so when we're talking about re bronchodilator reversibility, um, it's it's your airways if they become narrowed. If you people with reversibility, that changes over time, and if it changes by a certain amount, then we say you've got reversible airways. In practice, everybody's airflow changes a little bit, um, but if you reach this certain threshold, then you're slightly arbitrarily said you have reversibility, and this was worked up for people with asthma. So if you give somebody a beta agonist drug, and the criteria that most people use, and the one we used in our study, is if your um, airflow goes up by 12%, pl and at least 200 millilitres improvement in FEV1, that's reversibility. If it's less than that, it doesn't mean that, as Maria was alluding to, it doesn't mean that you won't get any benefit from an inhaler, um, but it's just the changes are smaller, and it is a helpful diagnostic test for asthma, and it's a sort of reference point. It's not as relevant for lab, actually. I've just got these couple of questions mm -hmm. from Facebook. So. Um, Natalia is asking, um, she had a pleurisesis procedure and three months later she's having pain in a specific place whenever she coughs or sneezes. Is that normal? Okay, so, so we see this a lot. Um, uh, people who were at the meeting last year will have heard lots of details, perhaps more than they wanted to hear about what a pleurodesis involves. Um, and so, so when you have a pleurodesis to, to fix pneumothorax, the lung is, um, is, is stuck to the chest wall. Um, as you breathe in and out, or stretch and move, um, Normally, your lung just slides over your chest wall. If you do something like take a deep breath or cough or sneeze, well, after you've had pleural surgery, the lung's stuck and it just pulls and, it, and it's painful. And that's, very, that's a very common symptom after, after surgery. It tends to go away, but often the sensations never go completely back to normal. I, I guess there's people in the room that have the same experience, probably. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, there was there was one more um, from Lucy. She says, "Hi, do you know of any link between LAM and sepsis? Please, I have just been diagnosed with LAM whilst being in hospital with sepsis." Um, not specifically. Um, when I was talking about, I, mean, I don't know any of the details about this, but sort of reading between the lines, what, what I was saying earlier about. We use CT a lot more now, and we sometimes see people diagnosed with LAM sort of by accident because they've had a scan. So very often, the thing that makes you find out you have LAM is if you have a scan for something else and they catch sight of the lung. So maybe as part of the test, that's a possibility. There's not a direct link. I don't. Mm -hmm. Women with LAM probably get more chest infections than women without LAM, but sepsis generally, in terms of the response to bad infections, there's, there's not a particular link. Okay, thank you. Uh, you know, this has not been formally diagnosed yet. Uh, you've been told that to go to Nottingham and they'll give a diagnosis. We'll try. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the trouble is the last time we went, I think her oxygen level had gone up a little bit from her last lung test. They now say you only go to Nottingham once you've been diagnosed. So the centre in Nottingham will see anybody um, who has suspected lamb or has diagnosed lamb, and will. We'll, uh, so we're happy to see anyone. The way the centre runs is it's commissioned centrally um, by NHS England, so your local person doesn't have to pay. Um, to, you know, it doesn't cost them anything to refer. Um, in fact, they're already paying for it because everybody pays a, a tiny fraction to, to fund the centre. So, um, so we'd be happy to see somebody who had suspected LAM, um, and either your hospital consultant or your GP can refer. Yeah, that, that's where we're having trouble. Okay. No one wants to commit to anything, so we're like, how do we get to Nottingham? Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, no, I, I, th I think that's it. I mean, it's, um, you know, we'd be happy to see them. I mean, um, um, I'm, you know, if you can't get anywhere, d d send me an email. I'd be happy to email your GP or local person okay, and yeah, just say right. that, you know, the service is there to, to work people up um, with suspected LAM. Um, that's brilliant, thanks. Have you recently been learning following you? I've been stalking you. Um, to the LAM Foundation in America. 
and um, have there been any uh, significant um, research or anything into what you've been talking about? Anything okay, so. So what are the exciting things I in research? So at the moment, we're in a state where we have a treatment, but it's not completely perfect. So I've shown you some data today s suggesting DLCO goes down a little bit more slowly, um, which is obviously a good thing, but still declines a little bit when you're on rapamycin. So most of the research at the moment is to try and find drugs that will improve the effect of rapamycin. And there are various clinical trials going on of things to add in to, to rapamycin treatment to, to try and improve on that. Um, there's lots of interesting research at the moment. I touched on this a little bit last year. And I haven't sort of talked about research update this year because mostly we're still slightly incrementally improving on things from, from last year because it t takes a while. But the other, the other exciting area is the realisation of what happens in the lungs of women with lamb, how the immune system interacts with, the, with lamb cells, how other cells in the lungs, which is one of the things that we work on in Nottingham that I think Debbie Clements is going to talk about later, interact with lamb. And it's opening possibilities for using other drugs that are in existence that modulate the immune system or, or modulate um, the deposition of extracellular matrix to try and improve treatments for LAM. So it, it, it's a way off treatment, but the, the, the good side of that is that most of these trials are using existing drugs that we already know are safe to treat people with. Um, it's not as if we had to get a new drug, we find a new target, we make a drug, and then 20 years later you can buy it. It's, it's, it's can we use other things to, to make lamb care better? So there's a lot happening, um, and we're hoping to get the readouts of those clinical trials um, fairly soon, actually. Tell you about them next year for sure.